going to discuss again Tristram Shandy, continue our discussion from last time, but I do want to repeat certain themes of Tristram Shandy that Frederick Carl raises in the adversary company, because I understand that several of the people watching this uh, by television didn't quite get this material. First of all, let's look and see what the dates for Tristram Shandy were, because they become somewhat important. Tristram Shandy, the first volume and the second volume, were written in 1759, were published in 1759 in York. <clears throat> and January 1760. Volume 3 came out one year later in 1761. Volumes 5 and 6 came out in December of 1761. Volumes 7 and 8 came out four years later in 1765. And Volume 9 came out two years later in 1767. The novel was an instant success when it came out, not only because it was so unusual, but because, frankly, it had some body passages that people were interested in reading. And these passages are discussed in poetry, in the Gentleman's Magazine, which was a newspaper, a journal being published at the time, in songs, in various brick bracks that were created as sales pieces for items that reminded people of Tristram Shandy, and we'll talk about those in a few moments. It was so successful that people began to write a lot of satires on Tristram Shandy, and Stern was known to say that he would like to see hundreds of such uh, satires written if it meant that people were reading and buying Tristram Shandy, and he was delighted with the reception the book received. Now, I'd like to reiterate some of the themes that we had mentioned last week, just to refresh in your memory. And the first theme <coughs> is the theme of conception. Now, when we talk about conception, we're, also, we're talking, of course, about the fact that Tristram Shandy was born, that he was conceived, and that he was the progeny, not only the first, but the, at least the second progeny of his mother and father, that <clears throat> what they were concerned with was uh, fulfilling family obligations. And as I mentioned to you last week, there are two family obligations that Walter Shandy always had at the beginning of each month. The first was to uh, wind the clock, and the second was to make love to his wife. Both of these uh, uh, obligations he fulfilled that evening of the conception. But as we know, Tristram is somewhat disturbed because his mother, who sometimes lacked confidence in her husband, at the moment of conception turned to her husband and asked him if he had wound the clock. And uh, Tristram, at the age of 41, writing about his life in Tristram Shandy, felt that his mother's inattentiveness to his begetting and his father's distraction with her statement drew from him a certain uh, attention that he needed that he should have had, and that all the attention that should have been devoted to him was not devoted to him. And so the idea of conception becomes really quite important in this, play, in, in this uh, novel. Not only that, but others, other things are conceived in the novel. Of course, the text itself is conceived by the author. And as Tristan begins to write his autobiography and tell us about his life, he is conceiving episodes that are in his mind, and we'll talk about how they get in his mind, because that's very important when we talk about the psychology of Tristram Shandy. Others conceive ideas. 
Walter Shandy conceives of an encyclopedia about his son's life. Mrs. Shandy conceives the kind of will or the kind of marriage contract she wants to have. Trim conceives a plant whereby he can trap Bridget and show her the earthworks that have been built up by Uncle Toby as a way to enticing her to his love affair. There are a number of episodes in Tristram Shandy that remind us of the act of conceiving. The next is begetting. It is not enough just to conceive a thing. It's got to act out. You've got to act it out. Now Tristram Shandy is in fact an enactment. It's an enactment of Tristram's desire to write his autobiography. Now Stern himself said that he wanted to turn out two volumes of Tristram Shandy every year of his life until the end of his life. He saw no reason to end it because begetting is the act of taking what you have in hand and acting upon it in some significant way. And of course begetting of Tristram is his delivery at birth, but the books delivered every year or every other year or every fourth year becomes a birth, a begetting. And so we can equate the delivery of these books with the delivery of children just as they become um, Stern's delivery, Tristan gives us his words. So begetting becomes part of the rhythm of Tristram Shandy. But we look at the next line, incompletion, coitus interruptus. Uh, literally, Mr. Shandy is not interrupted because nine months later Tristram is born. But there is that interruption. And to a large extent, this novel dwells on the subject that life is always being interrupted. It doesn't matter whether you're reading a book, you're going to be interrupted. It doesn't matter whether you are getting dressed, putting on your, uh, in the 18th century, putting on your wig. And Uncle Toby and Walter Shandy discussed the act of putting on wigs, and the comment is said that if you, uh, if you marry, make sure that you keep shaving your head so that you, the woman you marry will never tell whether the bald spots on your head are there by virtue of your decision or by virtue of nature and your growing old. So that the act of incompletion means always have these, you'll always have these interruptions. You'll always have these moments when you can't do what you want to do. You'll always have these episodes of thought that interrupt the trains of thought you are dwelling upon. And as you see, as you go through Tristram Shandy, every time you think you're on a track to follow a certain course of action, you are interrupted with a trail, with a tale, with a narrative, with a reminder and an association of an idea that draws you to another area uh, when you are reminded of parts in York, then you're reminded of the midwife whom he persuaded to uh, enter midwife, midwifery, midwifery at a certain point. Uh, life is not the clear duration of events that progress from one circumstance to another. And uh, we wish it were, but what this novel tries to do then is emulate life. When we get to the subject of the midwife, we recognize that there are doctors, sophisticated people of medicine, whose drunkenness or whose uh, corruption by the system has led them to be less efficient than they ought to be, 
And so we have to go to people who can deliver naturally, who can deliver children naturally. And we have the idea of the midwife here. And consequently, the idea of the midwife, according to Frederick Carl in The Adversary Company, suggests that there is a difference between the country and the city. We discover the difference between the country and the city, too, when Walter Shandy insists that his wife give birth in the country, but she insists on giving birth in London. And when she does go to London, and it's a false alarm, then he holds her to the contract that he only had to do it once, and Tristram is born in the country, much to Tristram's uh, discomfort. The next item we get to is naming. There are a number of names in this novel that are significant. But when we begin to talk about naming as a device, we'll talk about uh, in a little later how John Locke uses names and what the significance of names is. But basically, we have a number of names in this work that become rather meaningful. We have, of course, uh, Walter and Toby, which seem to be commonplace names. We have Slop, the doctor, whose name gives us an indication of his care and his skill. We have Trim, who is Uncle Toby's aide, and we get some idea of his uh, alacrity, his skill, his mobility, his willingness to help. He's not slothful. He is, in fact, quite adventurous and quite aggressive. We have uh, the widow Wadman. Uh, and Bridget. Bridget is a typical name for a maid servant in the 18th century. And so through the names, we get some idea of who these characters are. We will, uh, in some way, also see other names. We'll discover the names of books, the names of authors that become important to Tristram Shandy and to Stern and to the reader. We become familiar with names like Slockenbergius, who is a traveler and who brings a special message uh, in the tale that's told about him. We move on to the realization that life is not simply a happy set of events. There are catastrophes in life. And the catastrophes, unfortunately, mount up with regard to a uh, Tristram. First, the catastrophe of his, the inattentiveness of his parents. Then the catastrophe of his being born where Dr. Slop mistakes his hip for his head and crushes his nose with the forceps, thinking he's grabbing the hips. And uh, poor Tristram then has to deal with a shortened or flattened nose, which is supported somehow and bridged with special tape. Other mishaps occur to Tristram that we'll uh, mention in a few moments. Other catastrophes occur, of course, in a, uh, Uncle Toby's wounding in the groin at the Battle of Namur in Belgium during the War of the Spanish Succession. Uh, and we'll move on and look at some of these other concerns. We're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about time tonight and trying to put time in its perspective. But time, of course, is relative. How many of you have gone to a football game, spent three hours at the game, enjoyed it, and that afternoon goes very quickly, and you hardly think a moment's passed? But then you come into a class like this, and you have to sit here for three hours, and somehow you end up looking at the clock and looking at your watch, and for some that three hours can be unendurable. <laughs> 
so time is relative. If I were to ask all of you to close your eyes and raise your hand and count off a minute, for some of you that minute would be 45 seconds, and for some of you that minute would be a minute and a half, because you have different ways of counting, and time is relative. Now, you have the narrator's time. Now, the narrator's time is a time fully decisive on his emphasis. If the narrator wants to take an event and spread it out at great length, then he can do that for one chapter or for two chapters. We notice we have one whole chapter where Bridget is waiting at the door. It's only a page long, but it's one whole chapter where Bridget is waiting at the door uh, for Uncle Toby to knock on, to rap on the door, and a rapper is held up for a full page until he drops it, and Bridget is holding her hand on the door for a full page until Toby drops the hammer on the door, and we know he wants to enter. Then we discover, for example, uh, uh, that when Uncle Toby and Trim are getting ready to visit the widow Wadman, we have multiple chapters at the end of book eight and multiple chapters at the beginning of book nine leading up to this moment and it's no more than a walk from the house from his house to the, her house and yet and, and time means nothing to Uncle Toby when he's getting dressed we understand he's putting on his best uniform but this best uniform has not been worn for 13 to 14 years since it was created, probably toward the end of his service. And so we discover that here's a time path where nothing has happened, where Uncle Toby has been somewhat sedentary, other than building his fortresses and having his, engaging his hobby horses during that time. And so time in this novel is delineated by words that indicate how time passes and events that indicate how time is extended in very short episodes. Now, every novelist, of course, picks and chooses what he wants to deal with. And we discover, in fact, that the novel begins in medias res, in the middle of things. The novel begins with the birth of Tristram, but numerous events have occurred before the novel, before Tristram was born. Numerous events occur after Tristram is born. We meet Tristram when he's born. We meet Tristram at his baptism, which is a... Uh, we, we meet Tristram at his... Uh, uh, when he's four years old. We meet Tristram when he's ten years old. And then, of course, we meet him when he's 41, when he is, in fact, telling us about this novel. So that time is really a very inventive thing in this novel. It's an association of ideas. And any time we're introduced with time, the question is, what occurs at a given time? And how do we involve ourselves in these events at a given time? The reading time of the novel, of course, is equated with the way the novel was written. People read volume 1 and 2 in 1795, the end of December, and January of 1760. So they read two volumes. Then they waited until a year passed before they read volumes 3 and 4. They waited almost 12 months before reading volumes 5 and 6. Volumes 7 and 8, they waited four years for, as I showed you before, and then they waited two years. Now, you have the advantage of reading it all at one time, so you don't have the illusion of this Rocky 1 and Rocky 2 and Rocky 3 and Rocky 4. Essentially, that's what it was. People waiting for the next great movie to come out by a Sylvester Stallone, in this case a uh, Lawrence Stern.
And so reading time becomes rather an interesting thing. Not only do you engage the time of the novel more quickly today than they did in the 18th century, but because most of us are not introduced to a classical education in high school or college unless you take Latin or unless you have a special course in world literature, you may not be familiar with a great deal of the material that Tristram quotes, that he cites, that he comments. He focuses on uh, Epictetus. He focuses on Horace. He focuses on uh, Plato. He focuses on classical writers. And unless you're intimately familiar with this literature, you could not uh, fully be aware of what he's saying or of the jokes that he's telling you, because sometimes he's using terms that have no relationship to the classical images he's giving you, but only to show a satirical contrast or an antithesis. Now, <clears throat> what the 18th century reader might have done is gone to these sources to check to see what it was that Lauren Stern was giving them. Or they might have gone back to the textbooks to check to see how these, these uh, lines corresponded with what they themselves were thinking. And you have that luxury too. Uh, what you do is read this book this semester, and then when you go to your master's thesis, you write a couple articles on one or two of the volumes, and then when you write your master's thesis, you explore it more fully, and then you, write, you wait another three years and write your doctoral dissertation on the classical imagery in Tristram Shandy, and you can devote a lifetime to it, and it may be worth your time. The other item is the character's sense of time. That is, what do the characters, how do the characters treat time? Well, we're going to look at the time schedule in a few moments just to see what is the relationship between the characters. But we know that the love affair between Uncle Toby and Widow Wadman is long and enduring, and it takes him quite a bit of courage finally to enter her house, at which point the, uh, a lot is left up to the reader's imagination about what actually happens there. When Obadiah has to deliver the surgeon's tools, or the obs obs obstetric tools, to uh, Dr. Slop, his ride on the horse in relationship to Dr. Slop's waiting for him is important. And then when Dr. Slop gets the bag and discovers that Obadiah was afraid that everything was going to fall out and so he tied multiple knots, then Dr. Slop either has to cut through the knots as though he were cutting through a Gordian's knot or else he has to uh, take the time to untie all the knots before he can draw off the forceps, during which time he curses Obadiah. Now the curse is an extended curse over a number of pages and will a, uh, during which other circumstances occur and the curse becomes a relationship between Dr. Slop and Obadiah and this relationship of events. We discover that there are hobby horses Every person has his own hobby horse. Of course, we know that Walter Shandy has his Tristopedia. He wants to create a new system of education for his son. And so he's concerned about his son's education and how this is going to develop and prove meaningful. That's number one. Number two... Uh, Uncle Toby, we know, is at war, always at war, trying to refabricate the Battle of Namer and other battles in which he was involved, and always building fortifications, much to a, uh, the catastrophe that will occur to Tristram Shandy. <clears throat> I've mentioned love and romance is a theme of the novel. We'll talk about 
the Tristopedia, the uh, effort by Walter Shandy to plan Tristram Shandy's life. And then the other is the idea of sentiment. This novel has a certain air to it which suggests a warmth toward people, a desire to accommodate people. It is not mean-spirited in that those who are faulty, those who are at fault, those who are suffering, those who are at a loss, are in fact treated with absolute magnanimity. And I'd like to draw on one example which is really somewhat anomalous just to show you what kind of magnanimity you have in this novel. And that is the um, I thought I had it here marked off in a moment. I'll come back to it as soon as I recall it after uh, after our break. But I I'll come back to that. I'm sorry. I thought I, I had a point I wanted to make, and I didn't have it marked as I thought I had it marked. But we will talk about the sentiment and about the concern for human life that we find in Tristram Shandy. Now what I'd like to do is actually look at the calendar events of this novel. One of the characteristics of the novel is that everything is out of event in terms of the calendar. You come across Tristram at the moment of conception, and then you hear so many other details that you wonder what the time scale is for this particular piece of writing. And so what I'd like to do now is have you document, document the actual time pattern of events so you can put them into perspective and then when we go back over them you can see how convoluted events have become because the fun in the novel of course is always trying to recall events and discover where they are mentioned as Tristram tries to recall the past. And if you look on the sheet, according to the calendar, the midwife is the first person born in this novel. And she's born in 1651. And as we discover, it does not enter midwifery until almost at the age of 47 she's decided to change the course of the events of her life but we'll get to that in a moment <clears throat> now the parson is the one who persuades her to go into midwifery but he hasn't met her yet but in 1693 he acquires his lean horse about 1695 Uncle Toby is discharged from the army with a wound in the groin and he's confined for four years to his room. Uh, he's certainly fortunate that he could recover and uh, the, the years in which he is confined may have been for two or three reasons. Number one, he's recovering. Number two, he is now in retirement, probably, possibly suffering depression because he no longer can follow his profession. And they are uh, all, of course, secluded to because his wound would preclude him from, uh, his, from a social life or the robust social life normally associated with soldiers. In 1697, Uncle Toby goes to, to London to live with his brother in London. And so we have a period from 51 to 97 and 46, 46 years in which events are uh, transpiring. We have not yet, of course, reached 
Tristram's birth at this point. In 1698, which is the year afterwards, the midwife takes up her profession, persuaded by the parson to do so. And in 1699, Aunt Dinah is married, having been gotten pregnant by the coachman. And in 1699, Uncle Toby discusses his war wound with Walter Shandy. In 1700, Yorick is about 26 years old. The parson, Yorick, is 27 years old, 26 years old. So he was probably born in what, 74. Which uh, Now, Uncle Toby retires from his turkey business in 1713 and decides to live at Shandy Hall. And it's about this time, which is really the end of the novel, where Uncle Toby is courting the widow Wadman. This becomes basically the sequence of events that we're somewhat familiar with. We're still not at Uncle Toby, at, at the uh, Tristram Shandy's birth, but we're moving toward that point. <clears throat> In 1716, Walter Shandy's, we get Walter Shandy's dissertation on his son's name. And about no, uh, I've got a mistake here, I'm sorry. Let me just tear that off right now. Put that up there. And I should have checked that. Right, there we are. Solve problems very fast in this, in this operation. Uh, we have Walter Shandy's dissertation on his son's name. In 1717, <coughs> Tristram's mother has a false warning of her pregnancy. And then the first Sunday of March 1718, Tristram is conceived. Now, you... The first Sunday of each month, of course, was the month, was the time at which uh, Uncle Toby performed these particular uh, uh, obligations. Now about March 25th, 1718, Brother Bobby is enrolled in school. And at some point, Uncle Toby is seen knocking the ashes out of his tobacco pipe before Tristram's birth. These are discussions because uh, Uncle Toby and uh, Walter Shandy are engaged in numerous points of discussion. But this becomes part of our understanding of the uh, the sequence of events in the novel. Tristram's birth, November 5th, 1718, is the culmination, of course, of the conception and the beginning. It's this point at which we have <coughs> 
a long, interminable series of events in which the doctor is waiting for the tools and then the long events in which he is trying to unknot the bag and the long series of events in which he is trying to uh, deliver Tristram at which point he breaks his nose. Then four years later on uh, 1723, five years later, Tristram is uh, in the house with his maid and she wants to, she puts him at the window so that he can urinate out of the window, but she doesn't realize that Trim has taken the window sash, the rope out of the window sash, in order to help mount uh, Uncle Toby's fortifications. And this window sash closes on Tristram and unceremoniously circumcises him. Uh, the maid is horrified. She says, it's all gone. But that's not what happens. It's just a, uh, a ritual for which no preparation had been made. 1728, five years later, we have Uncle Toby's episode with a fly. And it's the episode with a fly that shows how compassionate he is and gives us a sense of the sentiment of the novel. We move on from there and we'll talk about the the Jews. Okay, let's let's get that back up here. Let's where were you? You saw that. Okay, we're going to get to that point, so just keep that on there for a moment. So everyone can look at it and copy it down. We don't want to rush things. All right. Did you get to that 1728 episode? All right. Now we're going to go to toward the end. We're moving toward the end of this dissertation. Now, I hope this clarifies things for you because it, it just puts everything in its lineal perspective. But, of course, it may, in fact, defeat the purpose of the novel, which is to read it in its non-lineal perspective as things develop. We go all the way to April 10th, 1733, where the thesis is presented to the doctors of the Sorbonne, giving evidence that Mrs. Shandy was not a papist. Seventeen thirty five to forty, Tristram enters Jesus College in Cambridge at the age of seventeen. Now that's rather late for someone entering college in the eighteenth century. Normally people would enter around thirteen or fourteen, but nothing happens to Tristram that is fully logical, as we already are aware of. Then in seventeen forty one Tristram is taking his European tour. He's in Denmark. 1749 is already the death of Parson Yorick. So he's 26 in 1749, uh, in 1700. In 1749, he's almost 76 years old at his death. March 9, 1759, Jenny accepts a cheap piece of stuff 
instead of an expensive piece of silk. And I have one more chart for us to look at just so you get some idea what this lineation is. And you get some idea how things are going. In 1759, which was the last volume in which the book appeared, we have Tristram writing his autobiography at the age of 41. Suffering, he says, asthma. I got skating against the wind in Flanders. And it's in this piece of information that he tells us that he is... Uh, he plans to write two volumes every year of his life. In 1760, there's a notation in your text, in your footnotes, that Stern is railing against people who are criticizing sermons, because in 1760, he published two volumes of sermons, and apparently, People didn't like them very well, or at least there was a lot of criticism of them. And so he has in his text some reference to these chapters that he, uh, to, to these books that he published. In 1761, he's still writing his narrative. And we know that seven years later, uh, he died. He suffered ill health. He published a, uh, volumes 9 in 1767. 1761, he's still writing, and we know that he published up till 1767 from the sheets I showed you, and in 1768, he passes away. Well, there's a, there are a number of points we're going to talk about in this book, and again, I'd like to now go over... a series of events that occur. Now those of you who have the version of Tristram Shandy in front of you, if you have the, uh, the full version, in the back there's an essay by Charles Parrish which summarizes parts of Tristram Shandy. And I'd like to look at this on page 640. If you have this, this textbook, that we've been looking at, turn to page 640, which gives you a, uh, a listing. You may want to look at this. All right. Good. Give it back to me in a few moments. Good, thank you. Let's go. Each of the books of Tristram Shandy has a different emphasis, and I'm going to go through them very quickly so that we understand what the emphasis is as we begin, be, uh, move on to discuss the nature of this novel. Now I'm going to summarize certain points of this as I look at each of these sections and you can draw your own conclusions. But book one deals with the nature of conception and we realize that the conception draws from the midwife. This is where we go back to the midwife to her beginnings. We learn about Mrs. Shandy's events, the marriage settlement, and a, uh, Uncle Toby's character. Now, what this novel has to do is the idea of conception. We conceive of hobby horses, we conceive of people, and we conceive of ideas in the past. So, book one is essentially sets us up for understanding past and present. And what's confusing about it, of course, is that so much happens before the first page that we suddenly discover that this novel is moving in a rather convoluted fashion, that we're beginning and ending at the same time. Book two is devoted to a large extent to Uncle Toby. Uncle Toby is in conversation uh, at the beginning where he discusses 
his idea of a map of Namor, and we get into what Tristram is the clue to Tristram Shandy when Tristram gives us some idea of John Locke, who talks about the history of what passes in a man's mind. We discover in this novel references to the widow Wadman and to Uncle Toby's relationships with her. We discover it was an unfortunate experience. And it was an unfortunate experience. Remember, it occurred before Tristram was born. Now, we won't get the full experience until we get to book eight and book nine, until we see it in its full complications, because we'll keep coming back to it. The piece ends with uh, Uncle Toby referring again to the armies in Flanders, riding his hobby horse, and an attempt to discover what the mind is about what the brain is about. Let's look at book three. Book three is the delivery. The realization of Tristram Shandy's being. The discovery that you cannot proceed beyond fate to dictate fate. The discovery that there will be tribulations for man at birth in pain, as Tristram is born in pain, and the discovery that a, uh, there is a discussion that's going to evolve on noses. Now, noses in the 18th century, uh, there were physiological studies of noses, there was a lot of medicine in noses. People were suffering from diseases, from venereal diseases, who lost appendages, would find themselves, uh, to some extent, without fingers, and without ears, and without noses. Women would cover their faces with makeup with a lead base, and consequently you would have a corruption of the flesh and a deterioration of appendages as well. In fact, if you were to go to the dental school at Baylor University in Dallas, you would find in their rare book room in the library a whole shelf of 18th century works just dealing with physiology and several books focusing just on the face and bone structures. But in Tristram Shandy, noses not only means uh, uh, noses, but it also has relationship to the male genitals, and you have the wit, in which noses are equated with sexuality, and the Slockenbergius' tale becomes the apogee of this particular discussion. So you have the novel dealing with Tristram's nose, which is broken, and then the, all the associations of ideas, which Locke, John Locke says are important and we'll talk about that in a few moments when, you get, when we get to that discussion. Book four deals with Slockenbergius and the discovery that greatness has its ways of identifying itself. Of course, Slockenbergius is great in certain ways, but Walter, who thinks his son is going to be great by calling him Trismegistus, discovers that because he's late for the baptism and this maid forgets the name, that instead of Trismegistus, which means greatness, that Tristram is called Tristram, Trist meaning sadness, rather than Trismegistus, which has the illusion of greatness. And so you have... Uh, the discovery that things not only are destined to be great, but fate cannot determine what is going to be great and what cannot be great. And then the novel pretty much ends with two tales. One is the chestnut burn uh, with Futorius, who uh, has a chestnut drop into his pants and then blames it on people at the table. <coughs> 
Uncle Toby in particular, and then the discovery that Bobby has died, and that is book four. And so death enters, and, and, and the, the, the primogeniture, the hope that Uncle Toby had that he would leave his estate to his eldest son is, again, fated to doom because the son dies without warning. <clears throat> Book five gives us a number of digressions. Uncle Toby wants more canon. We get the idea of Steenkirk. We get a story by Yorick, the battle between Gymnast and Trippet. We get Uncle Toby trying to give us, uh, Uncle Wal uh, Walter trying to give us a sense of what education is all about. And uh, then the Tristopedia, the whole essay ending with the idea, beginning with a study of plagiarism, ending with a study of verbs, indicating that all of this is a matter of words, that words are ideas given a graphemic expression and that the whole act of begetting in Tristram Shandy is the act of an author's writing down what's in the minds of people and the minds of people expressing their ideas with words. So the, the book five becomes almost a memorial to the nature of words and the accidental nature of being. Book six The author, according to this entry, looks back at his work and marvels at the quantity of jackasses in the world. Again, you now are into the story. You not only get Dr. Slop and Susanna uh, determining how to dress Tristram's wound, but you get the author who has to go past the digression on the fever in order to get back to his story. Because Tristram is now old enough to wear breeches, you have a whole episode on breeches and then Uncle Toby breaching certain battle battlements and uh, uh, the, the book, book six essentially deals with the problems of the world and it ends with our discovery that Uncle Toby having concluded peace on the battlefield now can turn his attentions to the widow Wadman, and the novel begins to move out. Now, this doesn't mean that that Lauren Stern was plotting out these novels consecutively in this manner. This only means that if we're going to make sense out of the novel, we have to begin to see whether these episodes have any kind of unity or not. Book seven. Uh, we know that Lauren Stern was suffering from uh, a form of tuberculosis. Uh, and we know that he was taking the trips to Europe to try to find some cure. So book seven is primarily a trip through Europe into France and a, uh, a return home. So book six becomes the European tour, tour, giving Tristram the worldly view, the continental view that's necessary for a person to achieve maturity. Book eight now focuses really on the theme of love. And we'll look at these episodes as we begin moving along. 
the book begins, as we see here, with a statement on the necessity of going forwards and backwards. And the author's desire to tell us that this is how he's going to write his book. He's going to go forwards and backwards. You know, it's not a very difficult understanding when you realize that sitting with your family members and sitting at home over the dinner table or sitting, sitting with guests or family people you haven't seen for a while and talking over the past, you invariably go years back to episodes that you found humorous, episodes that you found witty. You hear of relatives who are alive and relatives who have died and you begin to recall what they were like and what their family relationships were like. This chapter gives us a sense of going backwards and forwards because we've, we realize that the courtship of Uncle Toby occurred before Tristram's birth. But the events are so prominent in the minds of the family that they bear retelling. And so in book eight, we see them being retold. We discover what Uncle Toby's sense of love is. We get some idea on nature and on the nature and philosophy of women. We even read a letter that Uncle Walter, or Uncle, um, I'm sorry, we even read a letter that I, that Walter writes to Uncle Toby on the nature of love, and that becomes a rather interesting point of Book Eight of Tristram Shandy. Book Nine, of course, is the concluding passage of Tristram Shandy and it deals with Uncle Toby and Trim going to the widow Wadman's house and to Bridget and at this point we discover that all this anticipation led up to a point where Uncle Toby was embarrassed by the widow Wadman and so decides not to marry her even after all this anticipation, which leads us back to that point of why Uncle Toby remains a bachelor as Tristram is born. And we move back to a rather interesting set of episodes which give us some insight into Tristram Shandy. Now, Tristram Shandy was a, quite a success in its time. I want to mention a few things that... Uh, some people accused it of good humor. Others said it was satire. Some in its day claimed it was almost indecent. Some critics tended to praise the pathetic, the pathos. Uh, we find, for example, that on page 27. Eugenius was convinced from this that the heart of his friend was broke. He squeezed his hand and then walked softly out of the room, weeping as he walked. York followed Eugenius with his eyes to the door. He then closed them and never opened them anymore. So a scene of death is treated with a certain sentiment and a certain uh, sadness. The novel was so popular in its day that it sold about 4,000 copies, although we understand that it was losing some favor toward the end of the period when in Book Nine, 3,500 copies were sold. People were somewhat interested in the morality of the piece. For example, Tristram tells us at one point, basing his ideas on philosophers like John Locke, who dealt with issues of moral sensibility. Tristram tells us in Trist, uh, Stern tells us in, in, in excuse me, Trist. <laughs> Stern tells us in Tristram Shandy uh, 
that your conscience is not a law. No, God and reason made the law and have placed conscience within you to determine according to the ebbs and flows of his own passion. God and reason made the law and have placed conscience within you to determine, not like an Asiatic cadi, according to the ebbs and flows of his own passions, but like, but like a British judge in this land of liberty and good sense, who makes no new law, but faithfully declares that law which he knows already written. That is, there is a natural law that we follow. It's a law that's given by God, and reason, and man has the capability to discern that law. And consequently, each person has a moral sensibility that he has somehow acquired that applies in Tristram Shandy to the determination of what is just or what is averse. We'll talk about it. What is offensive and what is not offensive. Criticism appeared against Tristram Shandy, which claimed that it was somewhat indecent. There was a pamphlet in 1760 entitled The Clockmaker's Outcry, which declared that people would gain a sexual connotation when someone asked, have you your clock wound up? And the clockmakers apparently felt that their, at least the satirists said, that their profession had been slandered by virtue of everyone's memorial of what this term meant. There was a poem that appeared in the May 1760 issue of the Gentleman's Magazine. And it reads something like this, which was a satire on Tristram Stern. Mind you, Stern is still alive when this poem appears in a London magazine in 1760 that talks about his, uh, his poem. The poem says, and of course a, uh, this is a preacher, an Anglican prebend, who is writing this book. Sure, a virgin may read as well as her creed what a Free Ben dares right and stand by. Was an answer so pert from a girl grown alert by reading her Tristan Shandai. Here's another limerick. The Quaker complains that his daughters are queens and wanton as wanton well can be. They neither inherit his grace nor his spirit. Oh, sir, we read Tristram Shandy. And this is the uh, satirist's opinion about how morals are turned by people who read and are debauched by Tristram Shandy. In the Clockmaker's Outcry, uh, the writer writes, Hitherto, Harmless watches are degraded into agents of debauchery. If a gentleman wind up his watch in company and looks affectionately at any particular lady, that is as much to say that he prefers her to all the rest and is in love with her. If she winds hers immediately after and reciprocates a look of fondness to him, it is as much to say on her side that she approves his passion. And then the writer says that I should live to see the unhappy day when sober and well-regulated clocks are treated as the alarms of lust. Well, of course, what we're going to suggest is that there is a certain joie de vivre, a certain joy of life, a certain pleasure in these amorous tales that are going to be told that we find in Tristram Shandy. There are other books
like Suki Shandy, which revives a female Shandy, and other books produced during this period that give us a sense that not only was this book popular, but it was being parodied, it was being satirized, it was being widely read by English culture, by the English society, and that its points, all of which, both moral and a, uh, less uh, salacious, were being absorbed by the readers. We'll... Uh, Samuel Johnson thought that a thing of novelty wouldn't last very long, and he thought that the passing fancy of Tristram Shandy uh, would be over in a little while. But Tristram Shandy has lasted for a great many years, and uh, it will continue. I just thought uh, I'm going to show you a few scenes from Hogarth just to give you some idea of the life of the country where we might see some events taking place. As you read, Aunt Dinah had been seduced by a coachman. Well, we'll suggest here what the coachman might have looked like in the 18th century and what these pictures are. There are some postillions on top of the coach. I'll zoom into them. There are your postillions. There's the baggage on the coach. There's the coachman probably hustling people into the coach. At the angel. A few more 18th century scenes that you may care to look at. Again, these are Hogarth's drawings. These are four groups of heads, probably faces that the 18th century well knew. You get some idea of the tumult and some of the life. This is called the chorus. This next one is called the undertakers. There they are with their wigs and the undertakers arms. All right, just just to get some idea of what people may be looking at in the 18th century or may be looking like. Have I shown you Gin Lane? All right, let's look at Gin Lane for a moment. Can we shine this on another photograph here? Gin Lane uh, is near Oxford Lane in England today. And this was a complaint by Hogarth in the 1730s against people drinking gin. Here is a woman who is falling to her, who is drunk or has, is inebriated. She's had too much gin. And she's ignoring her child who is falling over the staircase to his death. Here are people before the pawnbroker trading in their pottery and their goods to the pawnbroker for gin, for money for gin. And if you notice the satirist here just to give you some sense of the satire. Here is a church still in existence in England near Oxford Square, near the Boston, near the uh, British Library. And notice that instead of 
a crucifix on top of the church, you've got the pawnbroker's balls which have taken over. And so you've got a cross up there, but it happens to be the wrong one. The pawnbroker has taken faith and morality away from these people, and they are uh, giving up everything for gin. Just to give you some idea of what's There's a coffin maker at the end of the street. Okay. <clears throat> the compliment to, oh, I guess I don't have the compliment to beer. Yeah. All right. The compliment to Gin Lane is Beer Street. Now, these are not very good engravings. This is an old book, and it just hasn't given me... Uh, it, we don't get as good engravings as Hogarth really did. I showed... But there you've got a man with a big round of beef carrying this big piece of beef. And the street has a lot of food, a lot of richness, a lot of uh, fine eating, and people who seem to be well-to-do, as opposed to Gin Lane, which showed them starving. Well, we're going to take a break now, and we'll come back and talk more about Tristram Shandy.